Well, hello faculty, hello students. My name is Horace Ballard. I'm the curator of American art here at the Williams College Museum of Art. And it is my pleasure in these uncertain and different and difficult times to welcome you to Landmarks. And I'm so delighted that you thought this show was worthy enough of your interest and your thought in this time. You know, this show really began when one of the biggest conversations we were having around the world was thinking about climate precarity and climate justice. And while those issues are definitely still at the fore of importance to people all around the world, we also are dealing with um, issues of pandemic and racial and social justice. I still believe that looking at photography can help us through this moment. And so I'm so delighted to return to Landmarks. This is my first time back in the space in six months to think about some of the themes and to highlight some of the really special works. Landmarks looks at over 120 years of photographs. The earliest one is about 1898 and the most recent one is 2018. And this period roughly spans the years between our own moment, 2020, but also the invention and the mass circulation of the Kodak Brownie camera in the year 1900, which made photography something that many people all around the world could enjoy. The exhibition, Landmarks, is based on four broad themes. Photographers going into the landscape to photograph landmark buildings and landmarks of an environment, as well as landmark impressions like incredible photographs of wars that changed the course of human history, as well as landmark photographs that were so important into both announcing new innovations in the medium itself. So we're gonna be playing fast and loose with time. One of the joys about this show is that we did not install it chronologically. We installed it thinking more about size and thinking more about urban centers versus more rural localities. And so I hope that you get a sense of the breadth, not only of the Williams collection of photographs, almost 3,500, but also the breadth of artistic practice all around the world. And of course, if you even, have even more questions and are deeply interested, you can always go to our website um, and learn more and also see the catalog for the show. I am standing in front of a wonderful work that is on loan to Williams for the course of this exhibition. This is an incredible work by Hiroshi Sugimoto from 1993, and it's from Sugimoto's theater series. Hiroshi Sugimoto, like another photographer many of you might know, Sally Mann, is often thought to be part of the New Romantics generation in photography. He is a photographer who's deeply interested in 19th and early 20th century practices. He also is deeply attuned to the ways that as human history advances and human civilizations grow and change, and thus the medium of photography also grows and change, we also lose something in that incredible innovation. And Sugimoto's incredible conceptual practice calls us back to attend to how the height of photographic innovation can also reference an older form of seeing the world. The theater series was started by Sugimoto in his first decade of arriving from Japan to Los Angeles in 1970s. And the series starts in 1978. This image is from 1993. It's an ongoing series. And it is an image of a drive-in, a very famous drive-in, the Van Buren drive-in in Los Angeles. And as you notice that in the center of this image is a huge white rectangle. Many might think that this is a moment of overexposure in the film itself. 
But this is the brilliance of Sugimoto's theater series because each of the images is a condensed version of an actual film that's playing, whether in a theater house or here in a drive-in. So say a film is about two hours and 30 minutes long. Sugimoto would condense that into a camera exposure that was 20 minutes and 30 minutes long. So what we're looking at is a 15 minute and 38 second exposure on an eight by 10 large format camera that is looking at film being played. But of course, over the length of time of that exposure, we actually get a blur in the image itself. However, in the built and natural environment around that moving image, when natural bodies like trees flaying in the wind or clouds are moving much more slowly than the rapidity of film, we actually get incredible stark clarity and gradations. So the sense that the human-made moving image is a blur, but the natural environment gives us incredible precision and these elongated, even elastic clouds at the cornices and right at the edge of the shot. The next photograph is one that is one of my favorites in the collection. And it is one of those photographs that I mentioned earlier that accords with the theme of a landmark impression in the history of photography. This is Bernice Abbott's 1932 Night View, New York. Take a look at this image. There is no center. There's no moment where there's kind of a central node and then we radiate out. And there's no moment from which we can go from say, the lower third of the image, which we would often think about in an image of this size as being the foreground to middle to back, right? In fact, what we're doing is looking straight down. Bernie Sabat hanged her camera from the 30th story of the Empire State Building on the shortest day of the year, December 20th, 1932, between the hours of 4.30 and 5, when the lights of Midtown were coming on. It is about a, anywhere from, we're not quite sure, but anywhere from about a 25 to a 28 minute exposure on a gray flex. Grayflex is a camera that you would have held about here and look down and take the picture this way. And it comes in a natural little case. And so she's hanging the case off the one of the gargoyles just to look at the city and then precariously going later to retrieve it. One of the things you notice about this image is that your eye is always moving. There's no point because there's no central node. There's no point where our eye rests. And so this image is famous as an impression in photography because it's one of the first images where we get that incredible modern rhythm that New York City is so famous for. It is a perfect alignment of a medium photography, which is often called the first and the best of the modern mediums, and an incredible world-class city. In the background, in the contextual kind of historicis of this image, is the sense that we are still deep in the heart of the Great Depression. And only months later after this image is made, Bernice Abbott is going to join her friends like Walker Evans, like Dorothea Lange, and, and take other incredibly important and incredibly iconic images of the American heartland during this time for the Farm Security Administration. But to think that we still now, even in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago, we have two great iconic images in kind of the civic imagination of the United States through photography. We have The Migrant Mother by Walker Evans, and we have Bernie Sabat's Night View of New York. Abbott worked for Man Ray, 
in Paris. And while she was Man Ray's studio assistant, she became not only adept at photography, but also deeply attuned, similar to Sugimoto, of the ways that the photograph, through a long exposure, can capture light. Next, we come to Winter Sunrise by Ansel Adams. This print was made in the winter of 1944. In 1943 and 1944, Ansel Adams was traveling around Yosemite National Park and was working for the Department of the Interior to take beautiful images of the natural environments, particularly lands that had just come under um, public domain through the federal um, government or lands that lobbyists wanted to come under the federal project and so they had to rise to what the Department of the Interior called a standard of beauty and perseverance for all Americans. And so after four days of being in and around Yosemite and please remember, this is 1943, 1944, where Ansel Adams is out there. There are also Japanese internment and relocation camps, one in particular called Mazinar, which Adams took many photographs of. So as he's coming back over from Mazinar, driving southeast, he comes upon a valley at sunrise. The story of this photograph, like the story of so many of Ansel Adams' photographs, is one of frisson, hecticness, and incredible grace. We have to remember that he's shooting with a large format, an 8x10 camera, and it is glass plates. So he exposes it for 15 seconds, and he can already tell he hates it. And then, if you notice right here, there is a horse that kept roving and moving and so even though the mountain was perfect and even though this ridge which we'll talk about in a second were perfect this horse created a blur right amongst this white patch that he already knew that back in the dark room he wanted to fully expose so he made three glass plates exposed from a period of 15 to 45 seconds each hated each one. And then, per his own words, finally the horse locked into place right where he wanted it to, and he knew he had 20 seconds to make the image, right? So it is a large format, eight by 10 camera again, and instead of on the platform, which he usually used, in order to get the ratio here that he wanted, what we think about as a more traditional image of the environment, a sfasado or a sfamato, as Leonardo da Vinci called it, in which we have gradations of color that smudge, that's what that word means, between light and dark as we go both up vertically and as we go back into the background, as we move from mid to back, right? Just look at this, this incredibly keyed out area, right? The dark ridge of light coming over equally high peaks behind him and the sun just breaking here. This is a work that is equally made in the 30 seconds of the plate's exposure and made in hours in the dark room. One of the myths about this photograph is true. Right here is a little LP. The local high school had painted, had cut the grass and then painted a big white circle, and then arranged rocks in LP. Earlier prints of this work, prints made directly in the mid to late 40s after it was taken, still showed the LP, and Ansel Adams hated it. He said it was an ugly carbuncle, 
in the photograph and one of the worst interventions that human beings had ever made on the landscape. He was not shy about augmenting photographs, even in the 1940s, to achieve for him a more standard of beauty. His words, not necessarily ours. But one of the interesting things is that you can only fix that in the dark room. And so Adams in his later life called this one of the most complex images that he ever made and ever had to print. Because with each successive printing, he was trying to get that LP more faint, more faint, and then invisible. With our print, it is almost invisible. And it didn't take him very long to achieve it. This print was probably made in about 1951, came into our collection in 1960, right? But it's so amazing that as he's playing with the contrast then between this hillock and the high peaks above, as he's making this darker, he also has to remember to keep this as light as possible so that you can get the articulation of trees and space. These three works came into the Williams College Museum of Arts collection about a year ago. They are in the order the artist prefers. Dick, 2018, Stone Bloom, 2018, and Soft Stone, 2015. The artist is El Perez the first non-binary photographer whose work came into the collection and a photographer that has deep roots here in the Berkshires and at Williams College as a former member of the faculty. Dick had the honor of being selected for the Whitney Biennial in 2019. These two works were in Elle's first solo show at MoMA PS1 in 2018 called Diablo. We are the only museum in the world that owns all three El Perez works and the only museum that have a triptych that in the artist's own words is a postmodern landscape in the making. Dick is a self-portrait Notice the confluences and the rhythms of geometric and curvilinear lines which at once seem to mesh and gel through the artist's own body but actually fragment and, and vector. And then we get Stone Bloom, an incredibly personal work made in the artist's home community of the Bronx. It is a photograph of a concrete floor splattered with decades of blood. This place was a former um, Jewish kosher deli, and then it became a Hillel butcher shop. And now it is abandoned, but that pigmentation from its former history still remain. And then Softstone, a work made in 2015 that El Perez confided when they first made the work, didn't quite know what they were doing on the roll, mostly checking light, mostly checking balance. However, this moment in Central Park, looking at wood that had become petrified as stone, and you can see in these incredible curvilinear scars and water lines, how wood and stone and water and leaves create this crevice that has an anthropomorphic field as if we're looking at the lower torso of the human figure. And then all three together give one both the sense of the artist changing space, an image made in Brooklyn, an image made in the artist's home community in the Bronx, an image made in Manhattan in the spaces that first gave the artist fame. We're looking at Elle's mapping of the city of New York and the way that the visceral impingement of the city on the body and the life of the mind work together and in concert. 
The artist is very frank about their own transitioning between and into gender. And to think about wood, stone, skin, mud, water, air, blood, coming together, uniting us, connecting us, is quite, quite powerful indeed. One of the significant impressions, moments, historical moments in the history of photography is the late 90s, when we go from what is often called analog photography to digital photography. We've just talked about the Ansel Adams and how even in the 40s, Ansel was not shy about augmenting, changing, changing the image to come to a vision that he wanted. L plays with scale and thinks about kind of scalar proportionalities that are now available to photographers with digital imaging, as well as digital augmenting of the print to bring color to the fore. But one of the beautiful kind of synergies between these three works is that the eye is constantly darting and making connections, making elisions. The eye is always bringing these together and separating them out again, and also thinking about them in various components and in various sequences. This is the artist's preferred sequence. Should another museum ever wish to show them, we have the artist's permission to make sure that they show them only in these three, um, in these th pairings, in this sequence, in this way. But of course, for students and faculty, should they wish to study them in our Rose Study Gallery, you can see individual photographs. One of the things that curators think a lot about is proximities between works and resonances over time. I had mentioned early in my introduction that this is one of the only photography exhibitions that you might encounter that is not hanging things either to chronology or to geo-specific location, but rather is thinking visually, almost sonically, between the rhythm of scale, the rhythm of color, the rhythm of place, about how legacies around certain content, legacies around certain positionings of the body in either the built or natural environment can form an affinity and allow a viewer to really explore with their own eyes works that they might know deeply and works that might be new to them. I just wanted to quickly point out that the works we just talked about by El Perez are hung in kind of a little secret garden of sorts in my mind between these incredible Anna Mendietas, two of the six Anna Mendietas in our collection, this really lovely work by Edward Weston, a work by Ache, and on the other side of Soft Stone by El Perez, this wonderful Robert Adams work, thinking about the scarification of land through a, um, a grain elevator. These series of works not only think about human imposition in the landscape and the relationship between human fluids and human skin and land mass, earth, loom, water, mud, sky, but also thinking about scarring and the impact of natural forces. And I just wanted to raise that because one of the great themes in El Perez's work is thinking about the natural intake of chemical substances, in this case, hormones that we all have within us, but when those hormones are escalated, they have an impact on the ways that we present gender. And in thinking about the ways that natural forces like water, like 
a footprint and then a fingerprint and water, like the collection of grain harvesting, naturally scar and change a landscape over seasons, over decades, over time. All of these artists, even Ache in thinking about a changing Paris going from the 19th to the 20th century, are all enmeshed in this broader conversation about human imposition on the built and the natural world. Landmarks is divided between two galleries, the larger 54 gallery at the top of the stairs in Lawrence Hall, and that gallery was really invested in thinking about the digital turn versus analog photography and representation of bodies and landscape. It was also a gallery that was really invested in the big stories and the histories of these incredible historic images in the history of photography. Now we're in the Crow Gallery, smaller in scale, a bit more intimate, and we do move naturally in a kind of counterclockwise positioning as we think here specifically about documentary photography. Walker Evans was a student at Williams only for about three semesters, but that was longer than he was a student anywhere else. And as one of the great documentary photographers of the 20th century, Williams very soon, um, after his incredible work on the Brooklyn Bridge series in the mid 20s, started collecting Walker Evans's work during his lifetime and then subsequent generations of his students giving Williams one of the largest single documentary photography collections of any college art museum in the country. Over the decades since the 20s, almost for about a century, curators have been putting their mark on the collection. One of the photographs that I deeply wanted for our renewed thinking about climate precarity, our renewed thinking about the interrelated lives that plants and animals and humans lead was that image that both in environmental sciences, religious studies, comparative lit, the history of photography, the history of science, astrophysics, astrology, that one image that brings all of those disciplines in the late 60s together and gave humans a landmark impression of their world. And that, of course, is William Anders's Earthrise image from December 24th, Christmas Eve for some, 1968. Broadcast live in, on seven different continents and over 50 different countries simultaneously, this image was the first time that human beings had seen the Earth from space. It is tilted. <laughs> and we've talked a lot about that tilting. There are two images here. There is the video feed image, which NASA showed through live stream, that in Great Britain, was tilted, but for an American audience on a 10 second delay was quickly flipped to give the American audience a sense of a horizon. Yeah? The sense that a horizon is necessary as we think about a landscape. But what we're looking at is the lunar surface of the moon and then the earth rising. The rise is created as Apollo 8, that very famous mission, they circled the moon eight times. And this photograph was taken on the sixth rotation. So as they're coming over the curve of the moon, the Earth appears to be rising through centripetal force. Okay. There are three photographs, all taken by William Anders on a Hasselblad camera. The first two are black and white. They were taken during the third and the fifth rotations. But as they began the sixth, Ander says to Jim Lovell, please pass me the canister of color film. And this was the image he took. 
that quote unquote blue marble coming up from out of the blackness. The fact that this photograph exists in NASA's hundreds of thousands of photographs by both astronomers and rovers now of these celestial bodies, their surfaces, their interrelationship to each other is quite extraordinary. This is one of the few that we actually attach a name to. One of the beautiful things that William Anders talks so eloquently about after this incredible iconic moment in history and moment of flight is how in the weightlessness of space there was no up, down, north, south. And so as they made that rotation over the lunar surface and he was trying to correct, he wanted this image of Africa. It was Africa that was able to pinpoint him and to what degrees of latitude and longitude they were looking and approaching the Earth. So this is Africa here, which means Europe would be back here in the dark, which means that it was day. If the sun's over here, it was day in the United States. And that sense of three Americans being in the blackness of space, seeing this incredible moment that human beings had never seen before, their Earth from outside of its orbit, and to know that even though they could not talk to and see the people in their own homeland, those people were being lit by the sun. It's a beautiful image. It's an incredibly poignant image. But for me, seeing Africa here, knowing that the Americas are over here, Europe is over here, it just conjures the incredible rarity for one image in an instant on a single day at this time in history to change the way that all human beings alive at that moment see themselves and their relationship to each other. And this image was one of them. It is one of the great documentary photographs of our time. This incredibly to scale photograph on a muslin banner is entitled Cotton Picking. And it dates from the year 2000 and it is by the artist Carrie Mae Weems. It is part of Miss Weems' The Hampton Project series. The Hampton Project was a series that had its debut here at the Williams College Museum of Art. The core of the series references the relationship between Williams College and Hampton University now in Tidewater, Virginia, my home after the Civil War, and in some cases, like in Tennessee at Fisk, even a little bit before, many young men from the North who were trained to be school teachers or ministers, particularly in the Lutheran and Methodist or the Congregationalist traditions and polities, started some of the renowned and incredibly formative for the African diaspora and native and indigenous communities, the groups of colleges and universities we now call historically black colleges and universities. Hampton is one of the oldest and from its founding, Hampton had a camera club. Photographers in our collection, like James Vanderzee here from the Berkshires, also made photographs from the Hampton Camera Club. And as many of you might remember, last winter, we displayed our wonderful portfolio of Van der Zee photographs from the 1890s through the 1960s. And the two earliest ones were also made in Tidewater, Virginia, when Van der Zee was working for the Hampton Photo Club. 
This image of sharecroppers picking cotton dates from either 1898 or 1899, and it was taken by one of the first women in the United States to make a living on her photographs, Frances Benjamin Johnston. She was from the Boston area. She had an incredible storied life, traveling west and abroad, wearing pants, riding bicycles, smoking cigars. And she, along with another Massachusetts resident, Fred Holland Day, made some of the most incredible images for the Hampton Photo Club that showed African Americans 30 years after quote unquote gaining freedom, still attending to landscape and to land. Carrie Mae Weems in the late 90s was interested in Francis Benjamin Johnston and was also interested in the Hampton Camera Club and the relationship between Northern colleges and Southern colleges liberal, mostly still all white institutions and historically black institutions for both students from the African diaspora and native and indigenous communities. And Williams had some of these incredible negatives as the first president of Hampton College was a Williams alum. So between Williams's own archive and Carrie Mae Weems on behalf of the college and her own practice going to Hampton to find the resultant photographs and whatever negatives there were. Weems re-photographed the negatives. So we're looking at kind of like a double negative photograph or re-photograph the photograph in some cases. But instead of using film, re-photographed using digital camera, and then took that high-res image and put them to scale on muslin banners that as one approaches the image, the banner naturally moves in the space of the gallery. Visibly, and syncopatedly making a connection between our lived experience and the contemporary moment and the past. Using scale, much like El Perez uses scale in the digital medium of photography, allows the viewer and the subject to have a very different relation to each other than say the eight by 10 images we're used to seeing from the middle of the 20th century at the heyday of documentary photography. So as this banner waves, we get to see this translucent skein filled with light and these bodies blur in with the landscape as the image ripples and as we are meant to move back and forth across it. One of the beauties of this series, for me as a curator, is it helps me think across time. So much of this exhibition is bracketed by time, 1900, 2018, 1920s, right after World War I, and thinking about images we have of the Vietnam War or World War II right around the corner. That ability of the photograph in its relatively brief modern history, though people have been making apertures and camera obscuras and camera blancas since the Middle Ages, if not before. But one of the beauties of modern photography is that the actual image itself, the image as object, tells you so much about the moment of its making, but the photograph is always meant to be seen in a future moment. 
And the moment of its making is always meant to be looked back on. And so many contemporary photographers are really engaging and interrogating that diachronic relationship between the now and the past, between the gallery and out in plain air making the image. And Carrie Mae Weems executes her examinations brilliantly in this transference of digital image of a late 19th century moment to scale in a way that only the contemporary moment could allow for. It's quite extraordinary, it's quite exciting, and that is why, for all of those reasons, it is in the center of this gallery as a kind of landmark in its own right of the center of the exhibition. About 10 years ago, the artist Peter Hugo was in touch with then curator of the collections, Katie Price, about the possibility of doing a show. And he wanted to do a show of the approximately 110 photographs in his now famous series entitled Ken, Photographs of a Post-Apartheid South Africa. Wickma ended up not doing the show, but Hugo enjoyed his experience working with Price and getting to learn about the special relationship between the museum and the curriculum that he allowed Wickma to keep the 98 color test prints that had been sent by the gallery as they were in the beginning stages of talking about whether an exhibition could even be possible. These test prints have been used in Object Lab, but never before used for exhibition until last year when a, and I'll be honest, much quicker than I anticipated, return reply email from both the artist and the gallery said that they knew that the test prints were here and they would be delighted for them to be used by Williams students in perpetuity and for internal use in exhibitions from our collections. In Landmarks, I've decided to display three of the images. And the one that I specifically wanted to touch upon as we think about documentary photography and as we think about relationship between bodies and land is this image here called Greenpoint Common taken in 2008 within a multi-year series that spanned from the moment that Peter Hugo had his own children in 2006 until 2013. I have never been, unfortunately, to South Africa, but for those who have and have spent some time in Cape Town, Greenpoint Common would not surprise me if it is familiar to you. Bounded by the high heel hills of Cape Town and particularly Signal Hill on all on one side and the Atlantic on the other, it is a place famous for its fog and for its wind-blown swept trees. Even a short exposure made either on film or through digital processes in this atmosphere creates this beautiful, and I'll use this word again, sfumato, where we have that smudge or that gradual gradation of color from brown to dark brown to green to light green to pea green to yellow to white all in this incredibly, almost classical landscape tradition. And here, instead of Staffage, we have a figure. A figure that the artist tells us is male, lying underneath this windswept tree. For Hugo, this windswept tree is an embodiment of his beloved country, South Africa itself, 
a place even in Hugo's words, two decades out of apartheid, is growing up but is not growing straight, is growing out, is growing swept by the winds of change, still has not charted its own course. The ambiguities of this image, is this posed, say like Timothy O'Sullivan or Matthew Brady's photographs of the Civil War, where we have a body under trees or stone embankments in a landscape? So is this staged and posed? Is this theatrical? Or is this documentary? Is this figure homeless or taking a nap? or both, or neither. These are questions that the photograph itself cannot give. In playing with these ambiguities and even what we might call ambivalences, the unknowing, Hugo is reminding us that while the photograph can give a sense of veracity, a photograph cannot give truth. A photograph cannot give a clear narrative, right? A photograph does not always have embedded the context clues to decode and decipher its own internal rhythms or interpretation always. What this also reminds us of is a broader question within documentary photography who has the right to look? Who has the right to say this is an image? Who has the right to say that this is art? And what is that distinction between art and documentary within photography? All of these are live questions and they're not new ones, right? And with every innovation or tech technological change in the medium, these questions are bound to come up again and again, and they should, and they should. But because this is a color test print, this is not to scale. For those who might know Hugo's work, like Carrie Mae Weems's work, like El Perez's work, photographers deeply at home in the digital processes of photography often consider scale as one of the formal elements to create in this postmodern moment, some might even call it post-postmodern moment, to create affinity and relationality, a kind of relational ethics rather than a relational aesthetics, something that makes us ask these big questions. So because this is a color print, we do not have the full scale work, which is much larger and the details would be much clearer, right? But even in that clarity of detail would not come clarity of narrative. And that's why Hugo felt comfortable allowing Wickma for internal use and, of course, for student study to keep and to display the color prints because scale here would not answer that fundamental question of who has the right to look. Before we close, I will also say that this photograph helps me also think through one of the big questions of the show, which is, what is a landscape, right? Why do some landscapes rise to the level of art? Why do some landscapes kind of eddy up in the cultural imagination at some moments and then fade from view in others? What charges a landscape and what histories does nature itself hold? Greenpoint Common is an incredibly charged space, I am given to understand, within Cape Town and within the country of South Africa. Both a space that was arrested from a black community, then a space that became home to racetrack and a polo club, then a space that was a 
public park, then a space that became the site of protest, then a space that became the site of homeless encampments. It is a space that has been so storied and iconic to the history of South Africa that it both belongs to everyone and in Hugo's words is also a no man's land. Right? And so this lone figure underneath this tree in this incredibly rich atmosphere, right? helps us think beyond the photograph into the contemporary moment, into the politics happening right now, to ask, what does it mean to document your home? What does it mean to then share that documentation, that photograph with the world? Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me, hitting some of the highlights of the collection and ways that event some of the broad themes. Please, 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 please be in touch with me or with Liz Gallerani, our incredible curator of academic programs, if you have more questions. And as always, open to appointment. These galleries are here for you. So thank you all so very much. And I hope that we'll be able to gather in person on the other side of this season. <laughs>